We could do a quick Ask Me Anything. <laughs> Keep it interesting. <laughs> Say some jokes. <laughs> Does he need? I think you should rap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does he need to start the Facebook Live with an announcement of any kind? Uh, well, I guess. Hey. Well, you mean like just to let everybody know what's going on? Yeah. Since it's Facebook Live. Then do you want to tell everyone what you're going to be talking about and what, where we are, maybe? I, I thought they wanted to report on that. <laughs> this is actually for our Facebook Live. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about an ongoing court case. Uh, we are, again, still waiting for the heads up on everything. But uh, for those that don't know, uh, when I released my first book of the Flat Earth Trilogy that I've written, Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch in 2015, we then released a challenge to the world, basically, uh, for anybody that could confirm through two repeatable, verifiable experiments that either the Earth was moving at excessive amounts of speed over 50 miles an hour, which even we know that they say it's 1,037 miles an hour, or that there was curvature that they could win the $8,250 that we had posted as reward. Um, and so that was to promote the first flat earth conference and we held that challenge and made it available to the world up until that time. And so should I just keep going with the presentation now? Okay. Joy, do you want to come up? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm just uh, going to place my this. Joy Garcia. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Together, we are collectively Sacred Word Publishing, and you, many of you have seen our booths out there. I have written uh, three books of a trilogy. The second, my tenth book, was The Firmament Vaulted Dome of the Earth. Uh, these are the, some of the 24 books that I've released. Uh, we've um, made available a lot of old, forgotten, forbidden, ancient manuscripts and collections of these ancient texts, as well as many flat earth uh, collections that are no longer in print. So you can find all this available at sacredwordpublishing.net. Yeah, and so we have now uh, we began November 11, 2016, and we have over 100 titles available of all of the different manuscripts that we've made uh, available for public consideration. Um, again, we started Sacred Word Publishing in 2016, November 11, and have, since that time have been really busy and diligent making a lot of books, especially on flat earth topics, that are not in print available to you, um, because I don't know if you are the same, but I like to read from a book. I don't like to read from a computer or from a Kindle or anything of that nature. I'm already looking at the computer a lot more than I want to be, and so, um, yeah, I, I like to have it in print form. And then another thing which is very interesting about the work and the books that we put out is that we release things in 14 point font. And so they're a larger uh, font. It's a lot easier on the eyes and a lot easier on the mind. And I find that you can read and study the material for a long, longer period of time without it taxing your eyes and making you wearisome. So uh, we also run a nonprofit called Endeavor Freedom. This is, you know, initially just to let you know kind of who we are and what we do. And through Endeavor Freedom, we support numerous charities and orphanages. Uh, these are three of the orphanages that we support, two in, uh, well, India, and then two in Africa, Uganda, and Kenya. And 100% of the donations that um, you give to us, we give directly to these orphanages and these charities, and you can find out more about our efforts at EndeavorFreedom.net. And also, um, we're 100% volunteer, and so there's no money taken away um, for administrative fees or anything of that nature. 
and also the money that you donate through uh, Endeavor Freedom, we can provide for you uh, a taxable write-off. And at the end of the year, January, February, near when you're going to file for taxes, we do make available uh, those write-offs for those of you that do support our work. So it is a win-win um, for the children as well as for what we are doing. And I also wanted to let you know that we are having uh, our own conference, the first one that we will be putting on, and this will be March the 27th through the 29th in Atlanta, Georgia. And we do currently have early bird tickets available. If you go to the website, sacredwordrevealed.com, you can find out more about um, the guest speakers and the conference, which will take place over the weekend. But we also have the Friday before, we're going to have a gathering where we go to the Georgia Guidestones together as a community. And it's about an hour away from the conference site. And so we'll make that a day trip uh, for those that do come. And, and we will be providing a bus for transportation. And so, you know, if you're interested, uh, some of the speakers, myself, Gary Wayne, Dr. Joy Pugh, Rob Skiba, Yana and Stephen Benoon of Israeli News Live, my son Justin James Garcia, Dr. Stephen Pigeon, and our really good friend Laurel Austin. And so um, some of these speakers don't attend a large number of conferences, and some of the topics that we're going to be covering are very controversial. Those of you that are familiar with my work, you know that I go into great detail about what occurred in the garden and how Eve's eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it has a sexual connotation associated to it, and that her begotten was actually her being impregnated by the devil with his firstborn, Cain who it says in the scriptures is of the wicked one. And so what we see in the world today and how what occurred in the garden connects to what we are dealing with with regard to the, the new world order and to the elites that are all of this singular bloodline is this ongoing enmity. And we see that in the parable of the kingdom and the sower and the tares of the field that Yeshua specifically made mention that this war would be ongoing until the end of days. He said, allow the tares to grow together with the wheat, and then at the time of the end, he would send forth his angels as reapers to gather the tares for burning and the wheat for preservation. And in my opinion, this knowledge, even though it's highly criticized and highly condemned, it is absolutely key for understanding so much that is still veiled within the ancient manuscripts. And specifically as to why it speaks about and gives a great accounting of whom begot whom and who was son of whom. And you'll see even in Luke chapter 3 that in the genealogy and the records of Christ uh, in his genealogical record, there Cain is excluded from this birthright. And so Christ is the seed of the woman that did crush the head of the serpent at the time that he was crucified on the cross. Just a really interesting story, and then we'll move on. Um, Yeshua being the seed of the woman, it says that the seed of the serpent would nip at his heel at the same time that he was crushing this serpent seed's head. And it was 1,600 years earlier that Daniel and um, David cutting off the head of Goliath and taking his head as trophy, he took it back to Jerusalem to present it as um, that he had conquered this Philistine giant, this Nephilim giant that had been mocking and poking fun of Saul and uh, his tribe and then taking it back to the place called Golgotha, which is, it means Goliath of Gath, that burying the skull there, Goliath's skull there, um, when Yeshua was crucified on the cross, 
the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 was actually fulfilled in that he would be crushing Goliath's skull at the same time it was nipping at his heel. And so that's the connection to the bloodlines. These are the, the three books that I've written on the, my journey to awakening with regard to flat earth and biblical cosmology. The first, the flat earth as key to the cryptic book of Enoch. When I came to this understanding and to the revelation of this knowledge, I, those of you that know my work, I study and have spent a great deal of time examining the ancient manuscripts. And there's a portion of the book of Enoch called the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries in book one, chapter 70 through 84 which Enoch describes in these 14 chapters the movement of the sun, the moon, the planets, the wandering stars, and the other luminaries as they move back and forth between the six gates of heaven. And the six gates of heaven span the areas between what we see here in the breakdown of the numbers, between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. And so Enoch describes how the sun over 30 days and will move back and forth between these gates. And so he's actually describing how the sun's movement and not the earth's movement, because there is no motion attributed to the earth. And we know that in the Bible, it says that the earth is fixed, stationary and unmoving, that it is the sun along with the other luminaries, which go in motion and Enoch describes this motion as being from east to west and then north and back to the east. And so understanding that what he is actually describing is a circle, then it makes sense that when you examine the timeless photography of the star trail over the course of the evening, that the stars and the planets are moving around the North Star Polaris and not around the sun. And so with this understanding, I re-examined all of those chapters, all of those verses, and realized that the only way one could understand what Enoch was describing uh, and what the angel Uriel had revealed to him was by applying it to the picture of the circle of the earth as backdrop for these motions. And so for the last 500 years since we have embraced heliocentrism and the Copernican model for understanding the world, this knowledge has been lost. But with the release of this book, you can go chapter by chapter and verse by verse through the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries and understand exactly what Enoch was shown by the angel Uriel and make sense of what has been hidden and encoded there for thousands of years. In my next book, this was my 10th, it was um, in doing this study for my flat earth book, the first one on the book of Enoch, I came to realize the firmament was key for understanding biblical cosmology as well. Because in the second day of creation and in all of the parallel accounts of the creative process that are found in not only Genesis, uh, but in many other extra biblical texts like the book of the secrets of Enoch, the cave of treasures, the book of Jubilees, the book of Jasher, uh, even the works of Flavius Josephus, and many others, that there's a parallel account of the seven days of creation. Well, in this book, I take all of those parallel accounts and put them together to bring forth the detail of what the ancient manuscripts are describing. And what we see is that it is describing how the earth and the heavens were created together as a unit on the first day. Just like what Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 22 makes mention of. He says that uh, God sits upon the circle of the earth and that the heavens spread out a curtain as a curtain above it, that together they form in shape what is a tabernacle or a tent. And so looking at examining this particular unit, you see in that image 
that this is the structure of the creation, that the circle of the earth that is spoken about in Proverbs as being inscribed upon the waters of the deep, that it was encapsulated by this solid dome, what we call the firmament, which comes from the Latin word firmament, which also in itself implies a hard, rigid structure. And that the Hebrew word rakia also speaks about a hard, extended surface. And so the firmament is also key for understanding biblical cosmology. Um, one second, sorry. On the third day, just two more days just to bring this forward. On the third day, you have the dry land being elevated from what is sea level. And we know and understanding now that the earth is a basin which contains the oceans of the world and that the dry land that is elevated above that sea level, that is the inhabitable part of the world. And so this is also again critical. But on the fourth day we see that the luminaries, which everybody believes, you know, that the earth is spinning around the sun and orbiting around the sun, the luminaries were not even created until the fourth day. And then they were placed, as it says in Psalms 19, the sun was placed in the tabernacle of the firmament, and it is in the tabernacle that it holds course. And so we see that without a doubt that the firmament is a very much larger stature than any of the luminaries, including the sun. And they tell us that the sun is 93 million miles away and that across its diameter, you can put 108 Earths side by side by side. And that's how small the Earth is. And this is absolutely contrary to what Scripture reveals. Because it says that the firmament encapsulating the circle of the Earth, the luminaries were placed into its tabernacle, and there they hold circuit. In the third book of this particular trilogy, Paradise, the Sides of the North and the Mount of the Congregation, which was my 19th book, um, it describes how the ancient explorers in books like the Inventio Fortunata and John D. he describes in the letter that he sent, uh, that Gerardus McCrater had sent him, and also the Northern Polar Projection Map, which you see in the image here, that Mercator describes the existence of what is described in the Bible as the Mount of the Congregation, and in other ancient mythologies as being Mount Meru, also Mount Olympus, and also Mount Zion, and Mount Sumeru. And this particular mountain is a lodestone, a black lodestone mountain, it's referenced as the Rupus Negra, which means the black rock. And it is completely free of vegetation. It's said to be magnetic, and the reason why all the compasses point north. And so this particular mountain is also said to be on the very top of it, inhabited by the sons of God, uh, the demigods. And we see that in the book of Job, uh, and even in Isaiah 14, that Lucifer, in describing where he wants to exalt himself above the stars and the clouds of God, he describes that location as being above the Mount of the Congregation. And I do believe that this was the area, as you see on the cover, uh, that is the center of the earth, the North Pole, that this is where this particular mountain exists. And it says that this is also where Jacob's ladder is, and that this whirlpool is referred to as the abysmal chasm, or the bottomless pit. And it is this that is an entryway into Sheol, or to Tartarus. And so in Isaiah 14, where Lucifer says that he wants to create his seat and to be uh, sitting upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, God says to him, instead, I'm going to cast you down into the sides of the pit. And so we know that this whirlpool leads down into the interior of the earth and that that is the domain of the devil. 
that his domain is within the interior of the earth, what the Bible also references as Abraham's bosom. Uh, one, one last thing. The other interesting thing about what is called the navel of the world, this particular whirlpool, is that it sucks in the ocean. Mercator describes it as an indwelling sea. It sucks the oceans in for six hours, and then after six hours, it spells them in geyser. And so this cycle, this rhythm, what is the breath of the earth, it creates the high and the low tide. And science tells us that it is the moon and the gravity of the moon pulling upon the earth which creates this particular phenomenon. But in truth, when you examine what is revealed within these ancient manuscripts, uh, it speaks about the navel of the world. And the Celtic mythology is called Hebelgomer. And so that's what this book is about. It goes into great detail as to the true specifics of the biblical cosmology and the circle of the earth and the Antarctic ice wall, all of that gives you you know, great detail of what the ancient explorers themselves say about this particular um, phenomena. And also in the Greek mythology, it speaks about Sharberus and, and that this particular sea monster, they called it a sea monster that Jason and the Argonauts, Odysseus in the Iliad, and also Virgil in Aeneid, uh, it, they all encountered this particular structure. And so when you read those stories, you get greater understanding as to that this is the abysmal chasm and the mount of the congregation that is found at the North Pole. <laughs> so the, the reason why I'm here and was asked to do this workshop is to, if any of you, God forbid, that you get sued for flat earth uh, or this particular topic, but as to how it was that I defended myself and also our belief that there is no curvature to the earth and curvature is non-existent. And so, um, according to the flat earth challenge, which I had spoken about earlier in this presentation, that after the publication of Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch in August of 2015, that we held this challenge. And it was to help also bring attention to the first international Flat Earth conference to be held in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so we had this challenge open until that time. And there were many individuals that sent and wanted to challenge us and to try to win the money that we had available for this challenge. And many of them, even though they had ideas, and, um, and even the individual that ended up suing me, he was a software engineer for Microsoft. And he created two particular programs, uh, supposedly to measure the curvature of the Earth, um, in between two of the towers on a structure like a bridge, and he said that uh, there would be maybe an inch and a half of deviation, but we know that that deviation is to keep tension on the suspension, the bridges, and that the towers aren't actually showing what is the real formula for measuring the curvature of the Earth. According to the formula, many of you are aware is that eight inches per mile squared, inversely um, squared. And so after, you know, which we'll go into and it will show uh, an accounting of how curvature, even in the first mile, there should be eight inches of deviation. But in the second mile, you eight, in, eight inches times eight inches, 64. Very quickly, you see that there's gonna be um, measurable curvature that should be easily determined and easily seen with, for instance, a laser test, or as Samuel Burley Robotham did with the Bedford Level experiment, he tied a mast, a flag to the mast of uh, a ship's pole, sent it out six miles, and realized that 
there was no deviation. According to the drop, there should have been easily over the first two miles uh, noticeable curvature. But coming to the realization that there was no curvature, he had to really re-examine what we had been indoctrinated and what we've been taught to uh, as the belief in the heliocentric Copernican model for understanding the world. And so um, this is to show that the judge actually did side with us initially in the first case and that we were able to verify according to the argument he was fighting for um, you know, that the earth was spherical in shape and that it did hold rotundity. And my whole argument, and I'll be speaking about how I and what I did present in a court of law. And you can actually find this case um, locked down in the public record in the Barrow County Magistrate Court system. It all took place July 11th of this past year. And when you go and you request those particular transcripts, you will see that I have 12 pages of arguments where I basically spoke about real world scenarios and real world examples that anybody can go and test and measure for themselves. And presenting this information to the judge, um, whereas his information was based on hy hy you know, hypothetical theories and uh, had nothing to do with the real world again. She did side with us and agreed that um, he did not deserve to win the money, nor that it was I liable for having to pay him, which being sued for $15,000, I was grateful to say the least. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I do believe that this case also set a precedent, at least I am not aware of or familiar with any other case that has been tried in this manner and that is, was contested before a judge and is now part of you know, the legal record. And so at least um, this will set a precedent going forth and that individuals, if you ever do find yourself having to speak about or defend the shape of the earth or the non-existent nature of curvature, that you can approach your argument in the manner that I laid out, which is first I started with how you can go to the earthscurvature.com and it shows to you that if the earth were a sphere in, uh, with a circumference of 24,901 miles, which is exactly what they say it is in Wiki and other NASA scientists, that this is the, the drop and what should be the amount of measurable curvature over the first, especially the first 10 miles. Because it's unnecessary even to get <coughs> beyond that, but uh, very quickly, because the eight inches is inversely squared, you see that um, it adds up very quickly. And especially over three, four miles, there should be enough curvature there that if you were to do a test with a laser pointer, that the curvature of the earth should be in the way that you're not able to see from one side of, to the other um, the particular laser pointer because we know that it's very straight and it's very true. And many of you have done this test and have presented your findings uh, in video on YouTube and other places. And so determining that the Earth has no curvature is not difficult at, at any manner. And so for any of us in arguing or speaking about or defending this truth with others, really that's all we have to do is encourage them to go out and to conduct this very simple, very easy and very, um, you know, you can repeat it and verify it for yourself no matter where you are in the world, you just have to find a stretch. And if you do it over water, we know that water will pull together and settle in a level. And even the considerations of the dynamics and the properties of water negate the whole belief that, you know, our oceans are adhering to a ball. 
or that are in some way gravity, gra with gravity magically glued to uh, the earth in the shape of a sphere or ball. I mean, it's totally nonsensical. Um, and so the properties and nature of water also nullifies that it could adhere to a ball. And so in speaking to the judge, the first thing that I did was to bring forth the math for determining curvature and to show that very quickly and even with simplified tests like the Bedford level experiment or um, the, you know, a laser test over a very short span, that you should be able to see and find enough measurable curvature um, that if it exists, you should be able to find it and it should negate the findings that we're bringing forth in real world scenario, which we'll go into now. And so, um, again, we, I spoke about initially the Bedford level experiment, which was a very um, important, and it was something that you can find information on in Wikipedia that Samuel Burley Robotham did. And it's something that is other people can do, just find a canal even six miles. Um, you should be able to repeat this test and to really quickly determine again that curvature is non-existent. So. And then the other, other examples that I brought forth out in court were things that I felt that the judge would recognize immediately. And that is um, how we can see islands, landmarks, lighthouses, cityscapes in excess of what should be possible according to the formula for determining and measuring supposed curvature. And so I brought forth how it is that people in New York and Philadelphia and other surrounding areas that live near the Statue of Liberty, that the Statue of Liberty can be easily seen at 60 miles extent. And so doing the, the calculations for determining curvature, the Statue of Liberty should be at 50 miles, 60 miles, hidden under a half a mile of curvature, which means that she would not, even the top of her uh, you know, the, the torch she's holding should not be visible, should not be possible. And yet the fact that people daily uh, from around this area can report and can see the Statue of Liberty every day and in normal situations um, over and over again is cause to reconsider what we've been taught as to the Earth being a globe or spherical in shape or that it holds rotundity and curvature, because if it did, again, this would be impossible uh, viewing it. And many of us know and heard about the Joshua Nowicki photo of which the weatherman described as being a mirage, and that we had our good brother, Rob Skiba and Rick Hummer, they went to test this hypothesis and they actually took and filmed from a boat, um, drove out from Lake Michigan, where Joshua Nowicki had taken this photo. And this is in excess of 60 miles distance. And again, according to the rate, the formula for determining curvature, viewing the Chicago skyline, even the very top, the antenna for the Sears Tower, which is the, the tallest building, in Chicago, it, I believe it's 1,700 feet. And so it should be, you shouldn't be able to see it, much less all of the rest of the buildings and you know the whole cityscape. You shouldn't be able to see any of it. And yet the individuals, the people, the populace that live in that area, in that particular region, they witness this daily. And so how can you explain to them that uh, curvature exists and that they not, sh should not be able to see the Chicago skyline that is supposed to be a mirage. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, another example based on real world situation is that, and this is something that individuals that live in Hawaii 
uh, near Oahu, you can see Kauai, the island of Kauai, at 90 miles distance. The top of the peak of the island of Kauai is said to be 2,700 feet above sea level, which is about half a mile. And yet, at 90 miles distance, you should have a full, over a full mile of curvature between you and the observer on the beach and that island, making it, again, impossible to see. And yet, you can see not only many features of the island, but also the topography of its hills and its valleys. And, and so, again, this should be impossible. And yet, just these three examples, the Bible says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, shall the truth be established. And so, this is, a, you know, a precedent for truth. And we see that not only with this particular White House, Lighthouse, but with lighthouses all around the world, that lighthouses are used by those that are you know, traveling on rough oceans, rough seas, and that they are especially dependent upon when you have weather, hurricanes, storms, um, you know, all kinds of rain showers, lightning storms, that could put people and lives and entire ships in danger. And so these lighthouses are seen in many times 30, 40, 50 miles. And in, like, William Carpenter's book on 200 crews, um, Eric DeBay, well, he did the 200 crews, and William Carpenter did the one on 100 crews. But you find that lighthouses are mentioned over and over and over, and as to their height above sea level, and as to the range that individuals traveling up on the seas are able to see and detect their light. And in that way, to um, to prevent crashing into shores or um, outcrops or anything of that nature. Um, and so the next aspect of my argument, what I went into after providing these real-world uh, circumstances, and to show and to appeal to the judge that uh, indeed people all over the world it didn't matter um, that there are structures which can be easily seen, which should be impossible to view, should curvature actually exist. And then I went into the fact that railroad engineers, surveyors, landscapers, individuals that create and build structures such as bridges, canals, and railroads, that they don't take into account the curvature of the earth when building these structures over sometimes hundreds of miles. And that, in fact, with regard to railroads and railroad tracks, they use what is called a datum to keep and to measure the level. And they try to keep the railroads as less, as far as hills and um, uh, inclines and declines, they try to keep it as level as possible in order to avoid um, the engineers, uh, the structures, the, the railroad engineers, having to travel up and to make even more dangerous going up and down these particular inclines and declines. They try to avoid all of that. And so the railroad tracks are laid on a level and instead of going up over uh, mountains, they will blast tunnels to go through them. And so they sh it shows that in the structure of trying to build railroads and these canals and uh, again these bridges, they are avoiding declines and inclines as much as possible. And they are trying to keep everything on a level. And then when you ask, um, you know, as far as the consideration for curvature and how they calculate it in to the establishment and the building of these structures, there is no such calculation determined or even considered. And so these are other things that are found, you know, again, in real world scenario, which verify the non-existent nature of curvature. The Suez Canal, uh, you know, other canals for hundreds of miles 
the sea level will remain the same. There's no deviation again as to, they say that, you know, over a certain amount of mileage, if there is curvature to the earth, that oceans should be humped, you know? And um, that rather than water being completely flat and level to the horizon, that the earth and being in the shape of a ball, that in the middle of the Pacific and the Atlantic oceans, there should be a, a wall of water miles high. And yet, we know that this is contrary to what is real, that water will never and cannot pool in such a manner to where it has in its shape a hump. It will always gather together and collect in a basin and settle out in a level. This is just natural, the properties, the physics and the dynamics of water. So water is a natural level and it also is something that, you know, nature provides that shows uh, the impossibility of the earth being uh, round in shape. Just recently, we had the world's longest bridge made in China. Uh, 102 miles. That, you know, if you look at the rate of what should be the curvature, that's 6,990 feet of curvature that should exist somewhere in the space of that bridge reaching from that mainland to this particular mainland. And if you look at the image, you see that it seems to be level, which again, the infrastructure of bridges, canals, railways, there is no curvature taken into account in their structure. Engineers do not account for it. There's no formula for it. There's no even consideration of it. And actually, the opposite is true. They try to maintain level and to, again, to exclude deviations of inclines and declines from the establishment of these structures over miles and miles and miles of, you know, as far as um, the span of them laying out uh, these particular structures. Now, we know that all truth passes through three stages. And the first is that it is immensely ridiculed. The second is that it's vehemently opposed. And the third is that eventually it comes to be acknowledged as self-evident. Now, I believe, and many of you have, who have attended over the last years these particular three conferences, that initially, especially with uh, the first conference, that even the media that showed up to capture the moment and to show to the world what was going on, that largely they were poking fun of, they were laughing at us, they were making fun of us, and they were trying to portray that image to the world that, you know, flat earthers are idiots, morons, uh, lunatics, and that these people have to be in some way mad to even consider that the shape of the earth could be anything other than what NASA and the Jesuits and all of the scientists, the astrophysicists, which I believe are the neoteric priests of Baal, that they have taught to us over the years. And we see how the indoctrination very early on, children that, you know, they gather in classroom around the globe and they're all looking at the place where they might live. And they think and they believe that you know, the globe is a true um, or the shape and the orientation of the world. They never ever consider that that could be a lie. They never ever second guess their indoctrination. And neither did we. We had no idea that, you know, uh, that this question had not been settled until forced to reconsider, and I know myself, when one of my friends and uh, my co-host, the hijacker, kept 
calling in on one of my broadcasts and begging me and asking me to look at flat earth and I was like you know I took three years of astronomy in college and I was this it's ludicrous I was not going to waste my time doing it but then I realized that I had to either prove myself a hypocrite or open myself to examining the information with open mind because unless one does so you cannot come to the truth of anything and so I did and it was very quickly, even the first day that I realized that curvature was non-existent. And that understanding that, uh, and that also that there was no motion to the earth and that the Bible also attested to that there being no motion to the earth. I was quickly forced to reconsider paradigm for understanding the world. And so I believe that's where we are now, that we are in between the second and the third stages and that we have moved on somewhat from the, oh, those guys are just morons and idiots and there's nothing to what they're saying, that uh, people are now you know, still trying to oppose us greatly, but the truth is on our side. I mean, you cannot deny that curvature is non-existent. And so forced to contend with that as a fact, no matter what you think about the shape of the earth, whether it's flat or round, there is no curvature. And so we have to really look at the Thank you, everybody. We appreciate all of you. Yes, the paradise side of the north and the north. Okay, gotcha. 
you don't one line you don't remember about from what century? Yeah. I'll probably, Can I take a picture? 14, 15? Oh, yeah, of course. Really? Okay, I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's on it's out there. Very yeah. outside yeah. of North America. Okay. Excellent. We can, we can get you to help me transfer off if you don't mind. Oh no problem. Down, huh? Yeah, let me get off the stage here real quick and then coming down this way. No, I think we're just gonna lift off. Oh. Here you go. Oh. Uh, yeah, we'll go over this way. Over this way? Yeah, these guys are on this side. Yeah, over on this side. Over here. If you can hold those. 